Hello and welcome back to Introduction to Logic. This is Unit 6, Induction and Informal Fallacies. In this short video, we'll look at fallacies that occur due to presumption and ambiguity in inductive reasoning. We know from the previous videos in this short series that fallacies are errors in the logical structure or content of an argument. We've already examined a number of examples of fallacies that can occur when the evidence provided for a conclusion fails to be relevant, such as appealing to pity or fear or appealing to the crowd, popularity, or attacking your opponent. In our last video, we explored examples of fallacies that occur when we fail to have sufficient evidence to make our conclusions more probable than not. We learned that we have to be extremely careful when drawing inductive conclusions based on authority and making generalizations on small data sets. We also saw that fear of an undesirable outcome is not evidence against a claim, nor is it the case that every analogy is going to hold in induction. In this final video, we'll examine the problem of making assumptions in the process of induction, and we'll conclude by looking at how ambiguity can undermine strong inductive reasoning. We know that good inductive reasoning is more difficult than deduction, since there's not a fixed set of rules to follow in inductive reasoning. The flexibility of the inductive approach is what gives it its wide application to diverse fields of human inquiry, but that very flexibility is also the very thing that works against it. There are so many things that can cause inductive arguments to go astray that we have to be on constant guard to ensure our arguments are as strong as possible. To put it another way, intellectual sloth is the mortal enemy of inductive reasoning, and the clearest expression of intellectual sloth is assumption. Now, we all learned in second grade what happens when we assume. You make an ass of you and me. So let's always be on guard against making assumptions in our arguments. It was our old friend Aristotle who first warned us against assuming what we were supposed to be proving. Whether we call it circular reasoning, or whether we call it petitio principi, or begging the question, it is always fallacious to assume the truth of our conclusion as evidence for its truth. Man, those are some funky looking birds. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, you look like a little tiny dinosaur. <laughs> No! There's one vicious baby bird. Dad, they aren't birds. Sure they are. They came from eggs in a bird's nest. Therefore, they're birds. Ixo, fatso. One, they don't have beaks. Two, they don't have feathers. And three, they're lizards. Poor Bart here assumes that any egg in a bird's nest must be a bird's egg. Now, in the absence of the obvious observation that lizards came out of the eggs, it would have been reasonable for him to expect birds to hatch from the eggs. But to conclude that the lizards are birds because they came from eggs in a bird's nest exposes the fact that predictive arguments are always inductive and might, as in this case, be wrong. Another common presumptive fallacy occurs when we assume that we must choose between two and only two options when there may in fact be more than two options available to us. Of course, there are genuine cases of exclusive disjunction, as we've learned in our exploration of propositional logic. But we also know that a disjunction really only tells us that at least one of the options will be true, not that they are the only possible options. In fact, for a disjunctive syllogism to be valid, we have to assume that the disjunction that we are presented with is exclusive, if we assume that either A or B must be true, and we know that A isn't, then B has to follow. But in order to be sound, it must also be the case that the original disjunction between A and B is exclusive. So just because disjunctive syllogisms are valid doesn't necessarily mean they're sound. For inductive arguments, on the other hand, we have no defined rule like disjunctive syllogism. So to begin an argument, by assuming an exclusive disjunction without justification is almost always going to be fallacious. 
The false dichotomy is particularly common in political debate, where arguments are often framed as a conflict between two exclusive political or economic options. Either you're a Republican or you're a Democrat. Either you're a capitalist or you're a socialist. Either you're for the war or you're unpatriotic. And so on. Our demands are simple. A small cost of living increase and some better equipment and supplies for your children. Oh, that's yeah. right. Give it to them. <laughs> yeah, in a dream world, we have a very tight budget to do what she's asking. We'd have to raise taxes. Raise oh, way too high as they are. Taxes is It's your children's future. Oh, yeah, that's children. Right. Children are important. Yes. 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 It'll cost you. Go to taxes. Come on! All right, that's a good point. Oh, yeah, the taxes! The finger thing means the taxes! So here we have a fallacious argument set up as an exclusive choice between supporting students or raising taxes, but there's really no reason whatsoever to assume that these choices are mutually exclusive. The fallacy of ignoratio elenchi, or ignoring the refutation, might be characterized as a fallacy of weak induction, or perhaps even a fallacy of relevance. But I think it fits in nicely in the category of presumption, because the fallacy is essentially an assumption about a conclusion not based on the presented evidence. It occurs when we assume a conclusion follows when it really doesn't, as this clip of Mr. Burns so beautifully illustrates. This sounds like bad news. Well, you'd think so, but all of your diseases are in perfect balance. If you have a moment, I can explain. Well, here's the door to your body, you see? And these are oversized novelty germs. Uh, that's influenza, that's bronchitis, and this cute little cuddlebug is pancreatic cancer. <laughs> here's what happens when they all try to get through the door at once. Move it, shout ahead. We call it Three Stooges Syndrome. So what you're saying is, I'm indestructible. Oh, no, no. In, in fact, even a slight breeze could... Indestructible. Now, here, Mr. Burns is clearly drawing the wrong conclusion from the evidence presented by the physician because he prefers to think of himself as invincible rather than very frail. But he's really just missing the point. Having looked at some examples of how assumption can cause induction to go astray, let's conclude by looking at how ambiguity can undermine what would otherwise be good inductive reasoning. The most common way this can happen is by applying two different definitions to the same term in the context of a single argument. You'll remember that in propositional logic, when we symbolized propositions, it was essential to use one and only one variable to represent a unique statement. Otherwise, the same variable might end up referring to two different statements, each of which have two distinct logically possible truth values, and this in turn could undermine the validity of our deduction. Well, a similar problem arises in induction if we fail to be clear about the meaning of a central term in an argument. It can cause us to think we're talking about one thing, when in fact we're really talking about two different things. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I'm throwing my head into the ring. I'm announcing my candidacy for the presidency of Earth. Just one question, 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 question. Scoop Chang, Beijing Bugle. Sir, the Constitution clearly states that nobody can be elected president more than twice. That's right, no body. But as you can plainly see, I've got a shiny new body. Now, Nixon's equivocation on the term body in this clip allows him to claim he's eligible to run for a third term as president. Since his body is not the same as it was when he won the second term in office, he claims the exclusion of the same person running for a third term doesn't apply. But this is obviously fallacious reasoning, turning on applying two different definitions to the term body. So this is equivocation. Now, the fallacies of composition and division are mirror opposites of one another and trade on confusing the properties of a complex entity with the properties of its parts and vice versa. Anyone who follows sports understands that an excellent team might be composed of individually mediocre players because what makes a team excellent is more than merely the sum of its parts. 
Inversely, just because a team owner went out and assembled the very best players in each and every position doesn't necessarily mean that the team as a whole is going to be an excellent team. Or consider the fact that objects visible to the naked eye are composed of atoms. The fallacy of division would suppose that since the whole object is visible, then all of the parts must also be visible to the naked eye. Of course, it would be equally fallacious to assert that since we cannot see atoms, that we cannot see objects composed of atoms. In both examples, we're confusing what's true of the compound must also be true of its constituent parts. Another common fallacy of ambiguity is called amphiboly, derived from the Greek word amphiblia, meaning to be of two distinct minds. It's similar to equivocation, but in amphiboly, the speaker is not mistaking two different meanings in a single context, but rather deliberately playing on the syntactical ambiguity or grammatical ambiguity in a particular sentence in order to draw a conclusion, as in this very famous example from Groucho Marx. One morning I shot an elephant in my pajamas. How he got in my pajamas, I don't know. When Groucho says, this morning I shot an elephant in my pajamas, what he really means is this morning, while wearing my pajamas, I shot an elephant. But the first expression is syntactically ambiguous, allowing him to conclude that somehow the elephant was wearing his pajamas when it was shot. This deliberate misreading of syntax is at the heart of amphiboly, drawing an unwarranted conclusion from an ambiguity in the language. As we bring this short video to a close, I want to emphasize again that the examples of the four species of informal fallacies we've explored in this short video series are just a very few of the many, many different kinds of logical errors that can occur in the process of induction. Since we don't have defined rules governing how inductive arguments work, there are an infinite variety of different kinds of inductive arguments that can be composed. And for each of those arguments, there's an almost infinite number of ways that they could fail. But by being on our guard, by considering whether the evidence offered in the premises is sufficient, relevant, and clear, we can avoid many of these inductive pitfalls. Also, keep in mind, the power of induction is also its weakness. The inductive method allows us to investigate almost any subject whatsoever, but that breadth of application opens the door for a multitude of errors just waiting to, dis to derail our reasoning process. Hence, evaluating inductive arguments for strength and cogency is really more of an art than it is a science. It requires a kind of expertise that only comes from lots of practice. But since most of the arguments that we use throughout our everyday lives are inductive, it's certainly worth our time and effort to become cognizant of their presence and of their reliability. So be vigilant out there and keep learning a little bit of logic.